Welcome back to What You Will Learn. My name is Adam Ashton. And my name is Adam Jones. Today, we're taking you through the best bits of How to Change by Katie Milkman, the science of getting from where you are to where you want to be. Not to be confused with Debbie Millman, who we interviewed earlier. This is Katie Milkman. And I think everybody knows that if you've ever tried to make a change in your life, there's so much uh, advice out there about how to succeed in making that change, whether it's to accomplish more at work or get better grades at school or get in shape or run a marathon or build your retirement nest egg. There's a whole bunch of advice, you know, tracking your steps with a Fitbit or setting smart goals or there's a whole bunch of stuff that people say works, often doesn't. <laughs> it often doesn't. There's the big explosion of your TED Talks and your books and your workshops and what you will learn podcasts yeah. and <laughs> we've, we've got a fair few apps out of <laughs> we've got a few apps on this uh, on this topic we've milked it a fair bit as well but uh there's one answer out of all of this like you can read all you want and you can learn all you want but at the end of the day change is bloody hard to actually do it but maybe a more useful answer than just dropping that mm. and then just ending this episode right here and just hitting stop <laughs> um it is just that you haven't found the right strategy yet that's right so the problem often is that we're taking generic advice you know generic advice like put a calendar reminder in or you know set an alarm on your phone with a prompt like that kind of generic advice and we're trying to apply it to our specific situation but what the milkman says is probably a better strategy is that is going to give you the best chance of success is to kind of size up your opponent whatever your obstacle is that you're trying to change and then attack it with a specific strategy for your specific situation at your specific time and place as opposed to just a generic strategy well we're talking about an opponent here the opponent isn't like playing any sort of game uh, where you're versing someone else. This opponent is inside your head. This is who you're competing with. Forgetfulness, lack of confidence, laziness. These are the sort of opponents that hold mm. back you from behavior change. So in this episode, we're going to drill down into what some of the biggest uh, opponents or the biggest obstacles are to change. And then, of course, not just talking about the obstacles, but actually talking about how can we actually beat that obstacle and successfully make the change that we want to make in our lives. We're going to start off our investigation into change with a pretty grim example, and that's the example of SIDS, which stands for Sudden Infant Death Syndrome, which is pretty much as bad as it sounds, Sudden Infant Death Syndrome. That sounds awful. Um, And every year, tens of thousands of babies around the world just suddenly die, inexplicably, in their sleep. Mm. So for decades, it was the leading cause of infant deaths in the USA. Doctors were bloody perplexed about what they could do about it until the early 1990s. They made a one hell of a breakthrough here. They found that putting babies to sleep on their backs, uh, they died of SIDS half the rate of those who slept on their stomachs. And this is probably something that everyone knows who's know someone who's had kids recently. And this presented an opportunity to save thousands of lives, but only if they acted quickly and spread the message. And parents acted quickly to change their behavior. Yeah, that's right. So the the doctors they found this solution, but it's it's not really good if they've just found it in the lab. They need to get there out there and tell everybody, hmm. and that way they can save you know half of these uh, potential deaths. So the government launched this back to sleep campaign, which is all about educating new parents about the importance of placing babies to sleep on their backs. And now, if you know anything about government health initiatives, you know that they're often pretty weak. <laughs> I, can't rem- I can't remember a recent government health initiative that's really oh, stuck in the brain. They haven't made me change. <laughs> oh, maybe they have through force rather than... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Or if you think about trying to counteract obesity, they launched a campaign where all the fast food stores had to label how many calories were in their food. You know, So you walk up to Macca's, you see the Big Mac and you say, oh, this is 2,300 calories. It means fuck all. Like, yeah. it doesn't really, like, it's not really going to make you change knowing that information. So, that was a big flop. But for parenthood, it's quite a different thing. And the back to sleep campaign was so successful compared to all their others. But thankfully, despite all the, all the flops of government campaigns in the past, SIDS was very different. It took off and it really did the trick. The percentage of infants put to sleep on their backs quadrupled from 17% to 73%, and death from SIDS plummeted. Yeah, I don't know if you'd ever see a, a government campaign that literally had a 4x result from 17 to 73%. That's very impressive. Mm, it's one hell of a result. But it raises the question like, why the hell was this one so successful when so many other ones sucked so much? Yeah, the big reason was all about timing. I should have given you that. <laughs> Remember there was a Dr. Carl joke? How do you, uh, what's, the, what's the most important part about telling a joke? Timing? 
<laughs> yeah, Paul, we kind of <laughs> fucked it. Uh, do, you, do you remember? We'll have to do it again. Mate, remember the... Ask me that question. Uh, what's the... What, what was the question? What's, what's the most, what's the most important? important thing about telling... Timing! <laughs> oh, God, the I like it. That was a pretty weak gag. <laughs> very well. weak gag. Very unrelated tangent to SIDS, a very serious topic that, we're, that we haven't taken too seriously. But the, the thing with the timing is that with SIDS, this back to sleep campaign, it hit them at the perfect moment. Because when you're becoming a new parent, it's really one of life's starkest turning points. The day before, you're just a normal a couple, you know, just two adults with nobody to look after. Then the next day, there's this crying, screaming, helpless, defenseless baby who just who needs to be clothed, hugged, fed, protected. And so you're just thinking, oh my God, there's, this is a massive change in my life. There's a whole bunch of stuff I need to learn and you're, you're ready to learn. You're open to learning and you want to know what the absolute best thing you can possibly do is. Yeah, like one day you just go to sleep, you wake up. And everything's bloody different. Everything about parenthood is new and different. And as a result, you're truly just starting afresh in your life. And you're about to install a bunch of new habits and changes. And you're probably receptive to make any sort of change, especially when it comes to your kid's life, isn't it? If you compare that to the the Maccas campaign where they were labeling how many calories are in there, you know, one day you walk into Maccas, there's not a whole lot different. There's nothing really prompting you to say how many calories this is. Well, it's is. your lunch break as well, isn't it? You're, just, you're going out for your lunch break. It's just another day in the office. It's just you, you're going about your routine. You're in autopilot and you just see the, you know, the kilojoules stuff. And you're like, fuck, I don't really care. I'm, <laughs> I'm, just, I'm hungry. I'm hungry. I'm hungry. I've had a shocking day. I need, to, I need my, my Macca's fix. But you're kind of stuck in those habits. you know. If, or maybe it's every day on the way home, you go to the drive through pick up a cheesy or pick up a Sunday, And uh, that's kind of just your hit. It's like a the habit that you're really stuck in and it's going to be very hard to change. Whereas like this parenthood, this new parenthood, this back to sleep campaign hits at the perfect time because big changes are happening. There aren't any ingrained habits already. So this is the opportunity to set the right habit in place. That's it. So here's the kicker. If you want to change your behavior or someone else's, you're at a huge advantage if you begin with a blank slate, a fresh start. And that way you got no old habits working against you. So the blank slate... Uh, a little bit like becoming a parent for the first time. It's extremely rare. So, really, we need to sort of engineer these moments, go out on the hunt or create these sort of blank slates in your life if you want to be engineering change into your life. That's right. So, the first real big obstacle to change is that inertia. You're stuck in your old ways. You've got your old ingrained habits. Uh, getting started or on this change is going to be a real tough point. It turns out that that fresh start is the best place to get started. But as you say, it's kind of tough to make a blank slate unless for these big things, you know, maybe getting married, having a kid, uh, they're massive sort of blank slate opportunities. But we need to kind of find our own blank slate opportunities in everyday life because we want to change more often than that. We do it sort of intuitively already a little bit, I think, with like New Year's resolutions. But uh, this is where like all the bad shit we did the year before, we can sort of like uh, start afresh and, yeah. and uh, we kind of know that. Uh, but you know, that's just one day out of the 365 days <laughs> yeah. of the year. If it's the 3rd of January, you might be waiting a long time to 1st of January the following year to make that change. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> that's it. So, we look for the other ones like calendar-based ones. You got your birthdays. That's a big one, mm. you know. Makes uh, sense. Big public holidays are a good point of reference. Um, little one, maybe the starting your diet on Monday or might be the start of the month. It might be the first of the new season. Uh, any sort of calendar-based ones is, is one you can engineer in. Yeah, definitely. I reckon there's there's plenty of opportunities you can find to have a calendar-based fresh start. Then there's also sort of these non-calendar-based fresh starts, things that are other life changes that you can then use as an opportunity for a, a fresh fresh start, a blank slate, like moving house, changing job, uh, buying a pet, getting a driver's license. There's all these other things that uh, aren't really date-based, that are more situational-based. So you can just say, okay, I'm starting afresh. I've got a new job, new job, new me. Let's start afresh. And Katie, she's not shooting from the hip here. A lot of her stuff here is backed by research um, that says the same sort of stuff. So, this, uh, researchers have studied things like the attendance at the college gym and found that students were more likely to use the gym in January or on Mondays. I'm going to test to that. Mm. Or after school holiday breaks, after their birthday. Another study looked at those who were making big changes like switching careers or entering a personal relationship, starting a diet yada, 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 uh, they found that 36% of successful attempts came after moving home compared to 13% of unsuccessful. Man, that's not trivial. 13% yeah. 
compared to 36%. That's like two yeah, that's, and a half times. That's right. So if you're saying you want to start this uh, new change, you're probably a 13% chance of making it stick. But if you're saying, okay, new house, I'm starting afresh, you, now you've got a 36% chance of making that stick. Yeah, I could imagine the goalposts can move. Like someone listening right now and they want to make a change, you go, oh, this is giving me permission to wait until the start of next year. I could imagine people just like, <laughs> you can't do that though, I reckon. I reckon the- Stick to a date and then yeah. that's like you're, you're fresh. And I reckon stick it can it. work both ways. You can kind of put it off to the next big fresh start or you can forcefully manufacture a new fresh start. Maybe you listen to this on a Friday before a big weekend of, of boozing and drinking and thinking, mm. I'll start the diet on Monday. But make sure you start it on Monday. Like that's only a couple of days away. Yeah. I Monday's, Monday's a good time to start. Whatever change that you want to make, start it this coming Monday. I like it. But at the end of the day, we need to look for these fresh start opportunities wherever you can. So if you want to make this positive change in your life, might be a little bit pessimistic about your chances. This is going to increase your odds by a big margin. So this is one of the big bangers. Uh, go out and start looking for those fresh opportunities and sort of just like inject the moments of change around those. I didn't plan metro station in Stockholm. Uh, that's how they call it. This capital city of Sweden, and it's the busiest urban center there. If you took a video there and you went for a stroll to the station, each day you'll see 100,000 passengers rush through the station heading to and from work, home, doctor's appointments, whatever they're doing that day. And like most train stations, there's nothing special going on. When you enter and exit, you can choose the stairs or you can choose the escalator just next to it. Of course... Most people, you see the stairs, you're like, you've had a big day or you've got a big day coming up. You're choosing the escalator, aren't you? Absolutely. And then just one night in 2009, a team of technicians from Volkswagen, they funded this little uh, funny, I don't, know if, I don't know if you call it a study, but it was at least a, a fun experiment. Uh, as everyone was asleep, you know, ready to go back to work the next day, the Volkswagen technicians popped into the train station. They began laying down these large black and white panels across the stairs leading up from the station and out into the city. And these normally boring drab staircase had actually been transformed into a set of giant working piano keys. So they had a video of the day before. The day before you got every single person on the escalator and then maybe one just weird dude on the stairs. But then the day the piano started, suddenly one guy, without knowing, just started walking up and he took the first step and heard this loud, you know, a low bass G note echoing through the halls he's like what the hell's going on and then he stepped up and it was an a and he you know he kept stepping up stepping up and he was like oh this is actually kind of cool the next person who heard it was like man that's i might have a crack at that so they went up there all of a sudden it seems like everybody is almost taking these stairs now they actually found that two-thirds of people 66 percent chose the stairs over the escalator compared to the day before when almost nobody did it that's it as a part of the video where they show the day before when before the, the keys and the pianos were working, obviously no one's taking the stairs and the day after it's just like the funnest thing in the world, right? Everyone's <laughs> just like jumping and dancing around and prancing. <laughs> bloody cool, there's man. like kids, there's like dogs going up and down. Oh, and everybody, mate, everyone was taking the stairs. Yeah, and especially if you're a piano, uh, piano player like yourself, I'd imagine you <laughs> spend right. half a day there. <laughs> I'll be trying to encourage people to come and do duets with me, jumping up and down on different keys and stuff. Yeah, you, you, your steps that day would be through the roof. <laughs> they would, yeah, you'd check the app and you'd see, oh, I did an extra thousand steps today. But it's something very, very simple um, that just, you know, a simple change of the stairs, like taking the stairs instead of the escalator can make a big difference to your health because 9% of premature deaths um, are caused by a lack of sufficient exercise, but it's just something that nobody ever does. We're not really saying that every staircase in the world you should get the Volkswagen <laughs> crew and just like change it into a piano and the whole world problems will be bloody <laughs> solved. Right. That's just an engineering. Just, it's just not going to happen, is it? Mm. Um, but what we're saying is that it is one of the biggest barriers to change and an overlooked solution is really embedded in this story because the barrier is simple. Like we all know what the right thing is and uh, it's usually the thing that's a bit of a pain in the ass mm. in the short term, like the the... the uh, you know, delaying your gratification is a hard bloody thing to do, even though you should be doing it. And all the areas we're trying to change, it's probably going to be in the end of like uh, getting rid of your short term gratification to have uh, achieve some sort of long term goal that you're after. That's right. You know that you should take the stairs, but then when that escalator is there and you've had a long day in the office, you oh, really can't be asked. Yeah. yeah. You really, you're going for that escalator. You know that for your afternoon snack, you probably should go for an apple or a pear instead of a chalky bar or a, or a cookie. But that chalky bar cookie is pretty tempting and you just think, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take the easy path here. Or you know that you should focus on your important task. You should eat that frog first, but it's pretty uncomfortable. It's that impulsivity. We're going for the easy short-term solution instead of the slightly more difficult but better long-term solution. 
Economists call this tendency for instant gratification, present bias, and uh, more commonly impulsivity, and it's pretty universal. And one of uh, our old pals from the podcast, Mary Poppins, she mm. knew this. She was a bit of a genius at engineering this sort of shit, good shit into the kids' lives to make them um, take on those little little dirty, ugly, toady frogs um, <laughs> and do the really things that are going to help the kids' lives. That's right. And the, really the way to conquer that, uh, you know, the, you're doing the thing that you don't really want to do is to kind of sweeten the deal a little bit. And uh, Big Bob... I don't know who Bob is, but he wrote the song for Mary Poppins. Well, Bob, I'm guessing, is the dude from the movie who she babysits. No, Bob's the songwriter. For oh. the, yeah. <laughs> Bob, Bob wrote the song. It'd be more convenient story. <laughs> if, anyway. <laughs> anyway, so Bob was, he was trying to write a song for the movie. He couldn't think of anything. And then one day he was inspired when his eight-year-old son came home and the son was saying, oh, we had this, you know, some people came around and gave us the polio vaccine today. And Bob was like, oh. Didn't know about that. Well, there's probably something to go into there. But anyway, so he said, well, did it hurt? And the kid's like, no, nah, they, gave, they gave me the jab, but they gave me a little spoonful of sugar uh, at the same time. So it was, I didn't even feel it. Mm, there you and go. And so Bob's like, hang on, there's something here. So that's seriously sweetening <laughs> the deal, isn't it? Yeah, and of course, right. that was the, the genesis of one of the all-time classics, just a spoon, hit it, Ash. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to hit it. But... <laughs> I take it. Yeah, you take just it. Just a spoonful mm-hmm. of sugar makes the medicine. Mm-hmm. So yeah. that's essentially <laughs> the uh, the crux of all this. We can take this spoonful of sugar because when we're trying to plan our change and we're having a bit of a, something that's a bit, a bit gross, um, something's a bit painful in the short term, inject a little bit of sugar, mm. metaphorical sugar, whatever that might be, and you're going to see some big, um, big differences to what you're trying to change there. That's right. It's like the escalator, very easy. Stairs, slightly more difficult. But when you chuck a few piano keys, it kind of sweetens the deal a bit for you to take the stairs. So we've got to think about, okay, if we're trying to make a change that we don't really want to do and we want to take the easy path, how can we sweeten the deal a little bit to help us make that change? So maybe you want to exercise more. One option is to sign up for the gym and head straight for the toughest uh, apparatus, maybe going for the Stairmaster, which is not a lot of fun. No. Or if you want to sweeten the deal, maybe you call up a, a mate to play a game of tennis or go for a round of golf. Actually, probably not much exercise in golf. Maybe tennis or kick the footy or something a bit more uh, high uh, aerobic requirements. Yeah, or do the old um, come up a few times and I think uh, when we did do Higgs book, if you're going to watch Netflix, uh, get the exercise bike. Probably one of the best mm. investments I got was an exercise bike for the home. Because like those guilty pleasures where you're just watching a crappy TV or something, get on the exercise bike as you're doing it. Yeah, it's pretty uh, pretty simple like that. Well, let's say you're starting a new diet. A lot of us will throw out all the, the fun stuff, all the chops and the chocolate and the ice cream and saying no to your Uber Eats burgers on your Thursday <laughs> night. Um, you bring go to Coles and you bring home a bag full of broccoli, spinach and kale. You're so pumped up. <laughs> this is bloody like telling my story from a few months ago, I think, when I when I started to try and lose weight. But this so, is like this is like dieting suicide. Oh, You're not really excited for that, are you? No, and you can probably maintain it for a couple of yeah, for me, it was about six weeks. <laughs> oh, that's, I, I thought you were going to say six hours. <laughs> well, you're pretty that, motivated. And then, and then like six weeks isn't a long time over the time of a life. <laughs> uh, a life right? It's not going to stay forever. So, you know, instead you might want to go out and let yourself have an extra budget to actually buy the, 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 the happy spot where you've got like the good healthy food, but you have to pay for it from your favorite restaurant or something. And that way, you know, you get the spoonful of sugar in mm. terms of being tasty, healthy food. Yeah, it definitely sweetens the deal a little bit. Again, you just probably got to be careful what uh, you classify as healthy food from the from the restaurant. You that pick- crept as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't work for me. <laughs> Subway. Subway's a killer there, I think. Um, but the thing is like when planning our change, I don't know how she got this number, but apparently 74% of people only ever consider the long-term benefits, whereas 26% of people think about not just the end goal, but how can I make that journey itself more enjoyable? And it's probably, we don't really have to tell you which one is more effective. If you're just thinking about the long-term goal and just trying to slog through it to get to the end, you're probably going to give up. Whereas if you're thinking, Mm. how can I add a bit of spoonful of sugar? How can I sweeten the deal to actually make the journey itself more enjoyable? I think she did shoot from the hip in terms of that stat there. There's nothing really to back (laughs) her up. sounds sounds (laughs) good. sounds good. (laughs) We'll take it. So the Nike Just Do It approach isn't the one that's going to really cut it. Instead... We need to do the Mary Poppins approach, so to speak. Um, just recognize that a spoonful of sugar is going to make the medicine go down. 
There was a bloke called Steve, and he was an analyst at the University of Pennsylvania's massive healthcare system. And one day he created a graph that he couldn't believe that he was looking at. Apparently, there was a massive problem that was costing the health system and patients 15 million bucks every single year. One day and overnight, it just vanished instantly. <laughs> so you're pretty happy about that. Steve, like quadruple and quintuple checked his data to make sure this wasn't a mistake. But then he confirmed, no, that's right. We just saved 15 million a year. So he did some digging and wondered what the bloody hell happened to save this and, or fix this problem overnight. He was asking around, you know, did anything big happen? Were there any big changes at the hospital in the last week? Were there any new best practices rolled out? Was there a new boss put in place? You try and make it out like, you try and like get that data and fit it. This is when Steve entered the business and <laughs> Steve <laughs> you try and like inject that in somewhere. <laughs> but he didn't. He was a nicer guy on that. <laughs> a, a quick sidetrack. Uh, uh, Alison started a new job uh, and she, was, she had a spreadsheet for the monthly report about conversion rates. And the guy was doing just the, the, the wrong average, like the formula was wrong. Mm. And so the conversion rate was like 3.5%. I was like, he's got his formula wrong. Change the formula, conversion rate now since Allison started has doubled. <laughs> <laughs> just because she fixed the Excel doc. <laughs> Jesus. I, reckon, I, I said, she's got to claim, claim that. It. Yeah, you, <laughs> wouldn't, you won't do that. Since I started, the conversion rate has doubled. <laughs> <laughs> This is what Steve should have done. <laughs> Steve should've. definitely should have claimed this. <laughs> but so what actually it was, it wasn't Steve-O with his data manipulation. It was actually a more genuine thing. Uh, and he found that it, the healthcare system, they'd been incurring fines from their insurers because doctors were kind of prescribing the wrong medicine or they were, ex, they were prescribing the more expensive, big brand, the well-known ones. So if someone needed uh, something, they'd pop them a Viagra instead of whatever the, you know, the home brand equivalent is or a, a Lipitor. I don't know what it is, but I'm sure doctors are like, yeah, oh yeah, that's the good shit. But is when that, you look- Is that you, the <laughs> prescription Viagra? No, no. Sounds that's like you're, you're onto this. Actually. I don't know what it is, but it, you know, they, they'd, be, they'd be like, oh yeah, that's the, that's the good stuff. When really, if you actually looked at the chemical breakdown, it's identical to the home brand cheap no-name one, um, but it just costs a hell of a lot more. Yeah, it might not sound like a big deal, but that extra 20% or 30% that you're paying for your, your Viagra, the big brand name compared to the no-name brand sort of thing, that adds up and mm. adds up to specifically 15 mil a year, which is which Steve found out one day. And previous to that, like doctors were always badgered by the hospital administrators to trying to get them stopped doing it. But for whatever reason, they just couldn't stop. They just kept prescribing the big brands. <laughs> That's right. Previously, only 75% of uh, prescriptions were the cheap one and 25% were the expensive one. Overnight, it showed up to 98% were the cheapos and only 2% were those more expensive ones. Yes, that's right. So, uh, patients paid less for the same medicine and the insurers, they stopped finding the hospitals for stuffing up. And it turns out that one of the biggest barriers to change and the reasons previously that they couldn't make this change was laziness. Mm. Something probably all of us are quite familiar with. Yeah, I'm sure you can think of a time where you wanted to change, but laziness got the better of you and you never did. That's it. So, humans, we tend to take the path of least resistance. We're passive. We go with the flow. Your subconscious, you got some sort of like ingrained habits of the ways you do it when you go onto autopilot. Has a lot of upsides there, right? Like it requires a less mental cognitive Definitely. effort every single day. And uh, there is some downsides when we're always just going with the flow because the flow isn't always where we want to go. <laughs> that's right. Yo. <laughs> bro. That, yo, bro. That's right. Keep going, man. Keep flowing. <laughs> Keep that flow going. Uh, but yeah, that's right. It turns out that, you know, you, you might want to, cook a home-cooked meal but the laziness kicks in and it's a lot easier to order open up uber eats so you might want to read a book before bed but it's a lot easier to open up netflix instead so there's the easy path and generally your laziness the path of least resistance that's generally going to be the one that you take so the kicker in the banger here is like one way you can do it is the old set it and forget it approach because it turns out that overnight change they got the doctors up from 75 percent to 98 percent Instantly, it was just simply just a cheeky little IT upgrade. Yeah, it wasn't a new, you know, training session where everybody Tony got in Robinson the room and, rock up and yeah. just get everyone to, to jump and bounce around and start handshaking <laughs> fifty times. All it was was it they made it easier that uh, previously you had to choose. Okay, this person needs this medicine. What's the first one that comes to mind? It's going to be the big brand that does all the big advertising and stuff. But now the the IT person they just made it a checkbox. If you say okay, this is the medicine that you need, tick the box. And if you that they just tick the home brand generic one, and you had to manually sort of override the system to type in if you wanted the special uh, fancy one, 
And doctors were like, you know what? I'm just going to tick the box. I'm not going to override it. And that's why only 2% of the people actually sort of went outside of that and went for the fancy one. Yeah, this has been a core thesis of a book we've had in our bookshelf for about, what, three years now? We never <laughs> read really it a long got time it. ago. Did you read it? Yeah, I read it. I read it a long time ago. We just never did an ep on it. Yeah. You reckon we'll do it at some stage? Probably. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> the book being nudged by Nobel Prize winner Richard Taylor and his co-author. Co-authors sometimes don't really get the same <laughs> limelight, do they? Cass Sunstein. You know and- who he is, yeah? Big Cass. We've read one of his books. Have we? Yeah, what book? exactly. That's it was a co-author. I oh. Don't remember it. It was <laughs> Kahneman's co-author of Noise. Oh Jesus! Yeah. Yeah, he's he done well, Cass. He's you know co-author with two Nobel Prize winners, but nobody knows who he is. He probably does all the heavy lifting, right? <laughs> he would. Yeah, but he found that like we often take the path of least resistance, and our laziness leads us to go for whatever the default is, whatever you're installed as the default. Mm. It's always just going to be the better option, and that's what everyone's going to be picking half the time. That's right. The big nudge example is comparing Austria and Germany, two very similar countries in terms of. You know, the, the types of people, they're literally right next door to each other. And uh, it turns out, though, that 15% of Germans are organ donors compared to 90% of Austrians who are organ donors. And the one simple difference is that Austria made their organ donation opt out. So it means that by default, everybody's an organ donor. If you don't want to be, you've got to manually choose to opt out of the system compared to Germany, which is opt-in, meaning you're nothing unless you actively choose to opt-in to organ donation. And as you can see, those differences are pretty massive. So people just go with the default and that's kind of what they stick with. Laziness takes over and we just stick with whatever the default is. Yeah, I like it. When I was doing organizing webinars last year and stuff like that, quite simply to change that, um, you know, the email sign up. Mm. We have that little checkbox from yeah. the very start. I have think it, people are starting to ca- catch on to it now. <laughs> have it pre checked and your email will catch a system will go through the roof. That's right. When you're going through all the, you're buying something online, mm. you've got to be careful. Make sure that the sign up to email marketing is, yeah. is uncheck that. And if you yeah. really want it to make it go through the roof, just put them on the list either way of whatever they check off. <laughs> that's, I mean, that's very, uh, that's illegal in this day and age, right? Is it? Yeah. Hey, you know, big, uh, European... oh, they're coming after me. Yeah. <laughs> GDPR. Wouldn't, wouldn't happen something. to the what you learn. <laughs> no, that's base. Right. Don't worry. <laughs> that's right. You have to opt in for that, not opt out. But our personal default settings are really our habits and habits are the behaviors, the routines, what we repeat consciously and unconsciously so many times that like you just go on autopilot and your whole day is automatic because of all these habits and they're essentially like your default setting. That's right. Brain scans have shown that once you've got a habit ingrained that the, your brain kind of switches off a little bit. It doesn't have to work as hard whenever you're performing actions. It's shown in all sorts of animals, you know, lab tests on rats, pigeons, monkeys that you can kind of create habits within these animals and then they kind of then follow that as a default setting. Thankfully, as humans, the same thing happens but we can actively choose these habits. We can choose what our sort of pre-programmed set and forget it default settings are. There's no shortage of habits book you've we've done in the past. So I think you can just scroll through and just yeah. get a whole whole bunch of them. They're all um, amazing because it is so critical mm. to making any sort of change. All sorts of research back it up. I'm sure anecdote, you probably just look at your own life and just realize that just basically habits are essentially everything. But of course, there's, there's research that just backs this up even further. Um, one of them was where they got uni students who were always easy to just coerce mm. with a little bit of cash and they're just scrambling over to getting the, the weekend beer money. But they were put into two different groups. Um, group one, they go to an information session, go to a follow-up meeting, then they have to hit the gym once within a month and you get 175 bucks. That's a that's pretty good for going to the gym once. Yeah. I'd, oh, man, I'm, I'm in. <laughs> yeah, sign us up. <laughs> I'm in. Group two, go to an information session, go to a follow-up meeting and hit the gym eight times in the month and then you get 175 bucks. Mm. A bit more effort. It's still not bad, you know, 20 bucks. And you go to the gym, getting paid to go to the gym. Mm. But it's a lot. You'd take the, you'd rather take group one. But uh, unsurprisingly, those that had to do the eight sessions of exercise, they did a lot more exercise. They went to the gym a, uh, a lot more times than the people who only went once, which is probably makes sense. They were mm. kind of forced to do it to get their 175 bucks. But more interesting than that is what happened after the study was completed. So those that had to go eight times within a month in order to get their paycheck they actually kept going at double the rate of those that just went once. So everybody mm. signed up to the gym, but the ones who had gone eight times and kind of, I guess you can see where this is going, the ones that had kind of formed this habit of going to the gym, they kept going to the gym. And they kept on going. If someone's owns a gym, this will be such a good strategy. You know how you go your free trials? Mm. Rather than just give a free trial, say you only get it for free or you get your first, three month, first two months free if you mm. go 10 times. Yeah, that's a good one. Sounds like a win-win. Yeah, you know, what, you know what's even better? I reckon if 
if you pay and then you get your money back if you go 10 times or something. So then yeah. the ones that don't go, you get their money. The ones that do go, they're locked in habit-wise. That's phenomenal. And you can have like a, <laughs> I'm sure some gyms are doing it, yeah. Maybe, yeah well, if they're not, I don't maybe we should are. start consulting to gyms. Maybe Fuck, we'll... we just gave away the secret though. <laughs> <laughs> so the beauty of habits is the set and forget approach. It takes a lot of effort up front to install it into your life. But once it's sort of injected into your brain and you've got these pathways of least, least resistance, it does become the default and it's much easier to continue it. Yeah, we've got that initial hurdle of laziness, which is kind of working against us. But once we install that habit... Laziness is kind of working for us because we're too lazy to change the habit again. So once it's locked in, laziness becomes our ally, not our enemy. So all of us, we can remember a time where we wanted to make a change. We tried to make a change. You might have a change that you want to make right now, but there's always been something stopping us, some obstacle, some quirk of human nature that's really holding us back. And this book was all about not trying to push harder to force the change, uh, but it was really about reducing those barriers or reducing those obstacles to change instead. Doing change, it's uh, an or, or transformative behavior in general. It's more like treating a chronic disease than just curing a rash. Mm. You can't just slap a little bit of cheeky ointment on it and, and expect it to just clear up forever. Um, we got to realize there's internal obstacles in the way of change, a little bit like the symptoms of a chronic disease. When we diagnose someone with diabetes, we don't put them on insulin for a month and then take them off and expect them to be cured. In medicine, doctors recognize that chronic diseases take a lifetime of treatment. The same goes for behavior change. We've got obstacles that we need to cure, things like your forgetfulness, temptation, underconfidence, laziness, conformity to the group behavior, procrastination, inertia, the human nature, and they require constant vigilance if you want to make your changes stick. That's right. You're going to have those initial obstacles that you've got to overcome. That's like slapping the ointment on the rash, but they're going to keep popping up and keep popping up. So, you need to kind of constantly be treating these symptoms as they pop up. But the good news is, is that maintaining change, you know, treating those symptoms or the, those obstacles when they pop up, it's far easier than initiating change in, you know, getting it started in the first place. So, the thing is, once you get this ball rolling, once you start this change, then it's going to be much easier to keep that bad boy rolling. 